Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Northrop Aircraft. Welcome to the Western Museum of Flight on behalf of the trustees and staff. We're so privileged to be the venue for the celebration and the anniversary of the founding of the Northrop Company. Now I especially want to thank Fred Peitzman, who has provided the inspiration for today's event. And that's appropriate because Fred and the Northrop Company were born in the same year. Take it away, Fred. That's why when I, when I was reminded last spring that, that the company was founded in 1939, I was really aware that, my gosh, this is its 75th birthday. So, it's great to see all of you here today uh, at, this, uh, at this wonderful event, uh, celebrating 75 years since the founding of uh, Northrop Aircraft. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, is, it, is, it has truly been great working with Suzanne and, uh, and, and our committee, which has worked so hard putting this event together. So thank you, Suzanne. I, I've been uh, volunteering with the Western Museum of Flight for the last 20 years, but before that, I worked for Northrop. Uh, I, start, I was really fortunate to, uh, uh, right out of college, be hired by Northrop to be a wind tunnel test engineer. And so I spent the next 33 years uh, being able to be involved in testing of all these wonderful airplanes that you see out here, plus a lot of, of, of other things that never got very far off the drawing board. Uh, it's not only, it's, it's great to have all these airplanes here. Uh, the, uh, the YF-23, the YF-17, the F-5A, a model of the B-35, uh, lots of uh, drones from our radio plane, Northrop Ventura era, and lots and lots of models and other things. There are a lot of things to look at in the museum. An awful lot of Northrop history is, is located right here. I hope you will spend the time uh, after, the, after the, uh, the speeches and after the lunch to, to go over there and, and really wander through the museum. Uh, you, you'll find a lot of history that a lot of you helped make. I'd like to give special thanks today to all of you who have made this history. You know, the Western Museum of Flight has two roles in life. One of them is, and our primary mission, is to preserve and present the history of aerospace in Southern California and primarily the aerospace industry, since the aerospace industry really turned Southern California from bean fields at the start of World War II into all of the things that we see here today. Our second role is to use that history and that legacy as a way to inspire and encourage the youth of today for careers in science and technology all of those STEM activities that we talk about so much today. This museum has a long history with Northrop. In fact, as many of you know, the museum itself was founded as, uh, because, because Northrop got involved with the project. In the 1970s, the N3PB, the first production airplane that Northrop ever built, uh, the, uh, the Norwegian government knew where one had sunk in, a, in an icy river in Iceland. And so they asked Northrop if they would help recover and restore that airplane. And Northrop fortunately said yes. And they created a nonprofit, and that's who we are. They created a nonprofit to do that restoration. Once the restoration was done, everybody said, you know, this was kind of fun. And uh, it's continued, one thing led to another, and we became a museum. I know there's at least one or two people here who were involved in that original restoration activity on the N3PB. I know Rich Morales is one of them, and I don't know who else. Are there other people that worked on the N3PB? There's a hand there and another hand there, and another hand. That's fantastic. Thank you. What, what, what you did helped us to get our start. The, uh, the, the museum today is uh, almost 100% funded by individuals. 
When it started, it was, uh, it was really a part of the company and they provided a space for us, but that hasn't happened in a long time. So for us to exist, it takes a lot of people that are supporters of the museum. And we are really happy, we're really happy that we've been able to exist for the last 30 some years and to be able to save these artifacts, these airplanes, the models, and the history for us all to be able to celebrate the 75th anniversary. We have grand plans for the future. I hope you looked by the membership table as you walked in and saw some neat artist renditions of what a new museum would look like. Uh, that's a few years down the road, but that's our plan is to have a bigger facility than we do now and be able to expand our programs even further. All of you helped make aerospace history. And if you agree with me that the history that you made is something special and needs to be preserved, I, I hope you will consider being a, uh, being a member of the museum and helping us to be able to extend this legacy so that future generations may know all of the things, all these wonderful things that you all helped create. It's people that have made Northrop what it is today. Uh, all of you here today, but there's one person that we really fondly remember at this point in time, and that is the founder of our company, Jack Northrop. Uh, how many of you have met Jack Northrop in your life? I'm sure lots of us have. That, uh, he, was a, he was a wonderful person, and he's the reason that there used to be signs up around the company years ago, Northrop, a good place to work. We are very happy today to have his son, John, here with us. It is great to have you here, John. And it's also wonderful to have some other family members. Uh, we have Janet Northrop Russell, who is John's daughter. And we have... And we have two grandsons of Jack Northrop, John Anthony, who's known as Tony Johansing, and Paul, who's known as Jerry, right? Did I pronounce that right? <laughs> Jerry Johansing. And, and special friends, uh, John and Kelly Tellis are here also. So it's great, it's great to have you all here. It makes this event very, very special to have representation from the person that founded this whole thing. Who could have imagined uh, 75 years ago that it would turn into a company of, uh, how many people now in the company? 100 and, Northrop Grumman? 70,000 70, people. Wow, what a, what a wonderful legacy we, uh, we have. I would like to now invite uh, Janet Northrop Russell forward to say a few words, thank you. It is truly an honor for us, the Northrop family, to attend this 75th anniversary celebration. I'm, in, I'm speaking on behalf of my dad, John, and his sister, Betty Johansen. Jack's grandchildren, my cousins, are here, uh, Jerry and Tony, as you met. Each of us have fond memories of being included in many milestones. And what I just wanted to mention was that we were, our family was there for the N3PB rollout, which was a beautiful event, and one day I'd love to go to Norway and see it <laughs> again. And also the 25th anniversary of the B2. Uh, my grandpa, if my grandpa were here today, I don't believe he would have thought his company would be here after 25 years. My dad remembers overhearing a conversation between Jack Northrup and Lamont Cohu, the CEO of the formation of Northrop in 1939. Jack said, I want Northrop to be a good place to work. And my dad just shared that with me and he said, accentuate the good, because that's how my grandpa said it. My most fond memories were the ones I shared with my grandpa himself through the eyes of a 12 year old. He was sick with pneumonia and had 24 hours to live. If that ended up being the case, I would not have the opportunity of really knowing him. 
However, he miraculously recovered and lived with us for the last two and a half years of his life. He had a passion for life and a love for his family. He was very disciplined with exercise and either my mom or I would take daily walks with him. He enjoyed playing gin rummy, um, which was his favorite game of choice, and sitting in front of the TV watching the news, uh, Cleet Roberts, McNeil Lair Report, and Lawrence Welk. I remember how kind and patient he was with me. He had a great sense of humor, and his ditties, his sayings, um, always were, that were always apropos for the, the moment and kept me entertained. He enjoyed family meals together. He would pay me 25 cents if I could make it through the meal without stretching. It was his way of trying to make me a better person and cure my bad habits. But of course, when my parents were up from the table, he himself would do something silly like put a spin on his napkin ring so that it would go to the middle of the table and then come back to him. <laughs> the only time I recall my grandpa talking about his company that he founded, in 19, uh, that he founded was in 1979 in front of Cleet Roberts and his camera crew that came over to our home. His story was a sad one. He recalled watching his flying wings destroyed in several stages of development, all because he did not merge with consolidated Valti, Convair. He had already lost his company once before, and he was not going to lose it again. Northrop Aircraft took his concept 50 years later and came up with the B-2 we have today. Northrop Corporation was able to take my grandpa's dream and make it a reality once again. 13 years ago, I was living in the black forest of Colorado Springs, hearing a noise and looking up through the tall pines and seeing the B-2 after it had flown over Air For the Air Force Academy Stadium. It was breathtaking. Many thanks to all of you here that have kept this company thriving. Because of your dedication and zealous commitment, we are here today and are able to celebrate this amazing milestone. Thank you, Western Museum of Flight, for making this day possible and keeping my grandpa's legacy alive in this building of flight history. I pray we can continue celebrating for years to come. God bless you all. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Suzanne Perkins, a 26-year employee of Northrop Grumman Corporation and a Northrop Legacy. I'm the current president of the Northrop Grumman Management Club California Sites. It's a pleasure and an honor to serve in this capacity and to welcome all of you here today. The, this unique club started in 1946, just seven years after the founding of Northrop Aircraft. It was formed by companies it was formed by the company's leaders to promote good fellowship and cooperation amongst members and to encourage the highest professional and ethical standards. Today, we carry on these very same principles 68 years later. I would like to say a few thank yous, one to Supervisor Mike Antonovich of Los Angeles County 5th District for providing the bus transportation from Palmdale site today. Also, <clears throat> Also, thank you to Lisa's Bon Appetit and Torrance for preparing our beautiful lunch. And also, a thank you to Mr. David Hadley for taking time out of his busy schedule to come visit today at the Western Museum of Flight on the 75th anniversary of Northrop. And also, one more thank you. Uh, that's for the Assistines, a local group of um, eighth through 12th grade girls who provided many baked goods for us today for community service hours. Mr. Jerry Huben was the longest serving employee in our company's history, 68 years of service, and we have four of his and his wife Dorothy's children in attendance today. They are Maureen Huben Hessler, Sharon Huben, Kathy Kali Lee Connie, and Kevin Huben.
Jerry Hubin was a dedicated professional engineer and a mentor to friend, a mentor and friend to many over the nearly seven years with seven decades at the company. Also, we have several aerospace legends in our presence today, and we admire and thank them for their extraordinary courage and contributions. Mr. Joe Gallagher is here this morning. We're thrilled to have him. Joe was the senior, senior Vice President of Programs and General Manager of Northrop Aircraft Division. Thank you. Also, notably, we have pilots from each, we have pilots for each of the beautiful Northrop and Grumman aircraft we have on static display today. They are Mr. Roy Martin. He's in the crowd. Yes, F5. F5 Chief Tep F5, Chief, Chief Test Pilot at Northrop Grumman Air Combat Systems and former President of the Society of Experimental Test Pilots. We also have Mr. Bob Edinger. He is here. He is a U.S. Air Force Test Pilot. He flew both the YF-17 and the YF-16 in the Joint Test Force. He's also the former President of the Society of Experimental Test Pilots. and. Mr. Manny Duarte, he's here, F-14, F-14 pilot and plane captain. And also Mr. Mike Foxgrover, YF-23, PAV-2, lead crew chief. Wow, okay, so moving on. It is my pleasure and privilege to introduce a visionary and inspirational leader who has a deep devotion to our company's past and strong commitments and to help us invent the future. Mr. Tom Weiss joined Northrop Grumman as an engineer in the B-2 Stealth Bomber Program, which celebrated its 25th anniversary of its first flight earlier this summer. Over the years, he has risen through the ranks to become Corporate Vice President and President of Northrop Grumman's aerospace system sector. He earned a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from the United University of Southern California and has completed numerous advanced management programs at other prestigious institutions including UCLA, Caltech, and MIT. Under his bold and energetic leadership, our sector is creating innovations that are shaping our industry and transforming our world as we work together to preserve freedom and advance human discovery. Please welcome the President of Northrop Grumman's Aerospace Sector, our distinguished guest, Mr. Tom Weiss. Well, good afternoon. I hope everybody's having a great time. And Suzanne, thank you for everything you're doing here. It's outstanding. Well, it really is uh, an incredible honor. And uh, just to take part in today's celebration and be just somehow connected to 20 or 75 years of incredible history. And when I, um, I appreciate the invite, and as I started to think about what I wanted to say you know, today, it, it was a bit humbling to think about the number of giants that have come before all of us in the company today. It really is a very special privilege to be part of a very special celebration. So I was talking to Suzanne, I said, well, how much time do I get to speak today? <laughs> and Suzanne instructed me to keep my remarks to three minutes. There's, uh, there's probably a larger message in there because I've not known for being brief. I thought to myself, how am I gonna talk about 75 years of history, but also talk about 75 years of looking forward. So I quickly did the math, and I said, for each minute I talk, I'm somehow gonna to have to cover 26 million minutes. <laughs> so I would suggest buckle up and let's hold on. In 1939, in Hawthorne, California, an incredibly innovative company was born. It was a company of bold dreamers, started by a great visionary and a brilliant engineer, under whose leadership Northrop Grumman would change the foundation of our country. But Jack Northrop and the innovations that formed Northrop Aircraft did not start in 1939. I'll take you back to 1911, when Jack had a moment that changed his life and his career forever. It was just eight years after the Wright brothers' historic flight at Kitty Hawk, and Jack was a 16-year-old boy living in Santa Barbara. On New Year's Eve, a French aviator landed a biplane on the front lawn 
of the Potter Hotel, sending a wave of excitement through the town. And somewhere in the crowd was the young Jack Northrop. In later years, he would describe the excitement and wonder he felt as he watched the aircraft lift off the ground and fly through the air. And that moment fueled his imagination throughout his life and throughout his career. All before Jack started Northrop Aircraft, he would lead the design or significantly contribute to the designs of some of the most incredible machines in aviation history. Jack was one of the first employees of the Lockheed Aircraft Manufacturing Company. It was Jack that designed the Vega aircraft, which arguably put Lockheed on the map. The Vega was one of the most advanced designs of its time. It was the first aircraft to cruise beyond 140 miles an hour, and it became as, as famous as the pilots that flew it, including Amelia Earhart and Wiley Post. Jack would go on to help uh, Don Hall at Ryan build a Spirit of St. Louis for Charles Lindbergh. Jack designed the wing that would allow the Spirit to make that historic nonstop flight from New York to Paris in 1927. But starting in 1939, the ingenuity, the inventions, the innovations, the bold, brilliant designs would accelerate from our company. And let me just name a few. One of them was the Northrop P-61 Black Widow, which is one of the most revolutionary planes of World War II. The invention, the invention of the Black Widow came out of necessity. You recall in the 1940 and 1941, the Germans bombed a series of British cities in a campaign known as the Blitz. The nightly raids lasted for much of a year, and the British came to the United States for help. It was Jack, Jack who answered the call with a radically new concept that became the first American night interceptor. The Black Widow was one of the best kept secrets of World War II. In the summer of 1944, it showed up in the European and Pacific regions and started to make a lot of progress. It flew under the cover of darkness, and in a matter of a few months, it virtually swept the skies clean of enemy aircraft. In 1940s, I believe one of the most advanced revolutionary designs emerged in our industry, and it emerged from Northrop. It was the flying wings. The design was patented in the 1940s, and in the next year received the first contract for what would be known as the XB-35 bomber. And redesigned as the jet-powered YB-49 in 1948, it broke every speed record in its class. And better yet, with its thin profile and flying 500 miles an hour, it was very difficult to detect on radar. It would not, however, be until 1989 that the world would see the culmination of Jack's work on flying wings. That was the year we unveiled the B-2 stealth bomber. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself on the B-2, more on that later, in the next hour. <laughs> During the late 1950s, the Air Force needed a plane they could train its pilots with, its first-line tactical aircraft fighter pilots. And again, our company answered the call. We designed and developed the nation's premier trainer, the T-38, which has been in service for more than 50 years. In the 1960s, Northrop made another bold move by placing a gamble on the creation of the F-5, which has been called perhaps the most effective U.S. fighter in the 1960s and 1970s. Then came the famous lifting body experiments in the 1960s and 1970s. We were conducting for NASA, the M2F2, M2F3, HL10. The lifting body research, as you will recall, was meant to demonstrate that landing without power was safe, and thus the, the engines were not required on the space shuttle to return back to Earth. You know, I had an opportunity to work with Bruce Peterson on the B-2 program in the 1980s. Bruce ran our safety program. I recall he was really good and really, really tough. If you recall the television show, The Six Million Dollar Man, Bruce was the pilot and survivor of the spectacular crash of the M2 F2. Northrop teamed with McDonnell Douglas for the Navy's lightweight fighter program called the FA-18 based upon our YF-17 design, and I never let anybody forget that. 
We would go on to build over 2,100 F-A-18 variants, and we still produce that aircraft today in the form of the Super Hornet. So now on to the B-2. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, we began to combine two great innovations, advanced survivability technologies and the flying wing. The smooth curvature approach to stealth used on our Tasser Blue aircraft would differentiate our designs from the facet approach used by Lockheed Martin in the one F-117. And the B-2 was, of course, a flying wing with the same wingspan of a YB-49. This past July, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the B-2's first flight. And it reminded me once again of the outstanding work our people have done and still do for this amazing weapon system. And I think about our Northrop company going up against the famed Skunk Works for the most advanced aircraft the world would ever know. In 1980, who would have bet a nickel on us that we would win? We would, and we did. So let me talk about our company today, Northrop Grumman. All the people who have worked for Northrop Aircraft and now Northrop Grumman share the incredible spirit of innovation that has built our company and has literally changed our world. We are linked to Jack Northrop and his iconic flying wings that would go on to serve as the foundation for stealth. We are connected to Leroy Grumman, whose brilliant approach to folding aircraft wings enabled modern Navy aircraft carrier fighting force. Every aircraft, manned and now unmanned, that flies off of the deck of a carrier flies so with Leroy Grumman. We are linked to Cy Ramo, who was and is a pioneer in space and the architect for the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Program. Every day, those missiles sit in their silos, fueled and at the ready, a symbol of strength that has brought decades of peace. We are connected to Burt Rattan, whose Spaceship One and follow-on Spaceship Two will completely change how we think about access to space, bringing a day where travels to hotels on orbit and even someday resorts on the moon will be as common as air travel is today. We are linked to Bob Mitchell, the father of modern fully autonomous unmanned aircraft revolution, systems that are rewriting in real time every journal of aviation. And we share the same spirit as Kent Cressa, who took the reins during an extremely difficult time and transformed our, corp our corporate culture by bringing in innovative companies that strengthened our own. But we all know ingenuity does not come from the top. It comes from within. And that is what makes me the most proud and honored to have played some small part over the last 28 years. So let me conclude by taking just a few moments and talk about the future. Today, that unyielding spirit of ingenuity and invention is still alive in the talented teams that are doing things that have never been done before. And they're led by people like Pablo Gonzalez, the program manager for the X-47B, which became the first unmanned vehicle to land and take off of an aircraft carrier and to have received our most latest Collier Trophy Award. And think about the next generation of autonomous systems that are becoming learning, adapting, and cognitive machines. Imagine 75 years into the future when we create autonomous machines that can grasp everything a human can learn in 20 years from kindergarten to grad school in just two weeks. And imagine 75 years into the future when our manufacturing techniques are so advanced we can just print them out. The next generation B-2, the next generation T-38 and F-5, the next generation X-47B, the sixth generation fighter, a new family of resilient military spacecraft and the commercial, commercialization of space are all right in front of us. And they will be the programs that fuel our company for the next 75 years. Our company creates the world's fastest computer chips, the most powerful lasers, and many, many other things we can't talk about. Our best is still yet to come, and each of us have Jack's DNA in our core. Innovation is in our blood. I'll leave you with one final thought. There's a lot of debate across our country today about being bold. 
you hear it is expressed as taking moonshots. On the one side of the debate, you'll hear some other aerospace CEOs talk about they're not doing any more moonshots. And on the other end, you'll hear places like Google CEO saying that they're focused on going for moonshots. Well, I enjoy the debate. We like moonshots. In fact, this year we celebrated our 45th anniversary of our first moonshot when we landed on the moon. Every human being to step onto the moon first stepped off the limb we built. We also celebrated this year the fifth anniversary of our L-Cross spacecraft that found water on the moon. Moonshots. Heck, we've been there, done that. We are now pushing way beyond moonshots. In just four years to the month, we will launch the James Webb Space Telescope. We are not just headed back to the moon. We are headed to the very beginnings of our universe, back 13 and a half billion years. We are going for a universe shot. We have set into motion the next 75 years of human space exploration and colonization. The water we found on the moon will enable electrical power and fuel, breathable oxygen, food growth, in the essence, both habitation and a refueling station. And thanks to this discovery, we will build colonies on the moon, create a permanent lunar base, a base that will not be the final destination, but the moon will be a booming town along the interstellar highway. And now with the James Webb Space Telescope and our newest concept, the Starshade, we will search for the signatures of life, helping to learn if habitable worlds really exist among the stars. So imagine 75 years from now, our company winning the Nobel Prize because we're the company that ends nearly five billion years of human cosmic isolation. When we find life on planets, such as the one designated as the Kepler-186f, also known as Earth's cousin, which is 490 light years away. Just imagine that day. Throughout the past, Northrop has brilliant teams of people who create incredible innovations like nothing the world has ever seen. Now together we have the opportunity to do some things, again, that people just can't imagine nor be bold enough to even try. In 75 years in the future, we'll hold an event just like this one, and people will be amazed and inspired by the extraordinary work we have done together. And just like when we talk about Jack Northrop's flying wings, people will say, wow, they were way ahead of their time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice. Our next speaker has over 50 years of technical and program management experience in the aerospace industry and academia. He was the Vice President of Engineering for Air Combat Systems and the F-18 Program Manager. Please welcome Brian Hunt. Hello. It's great to see so many old friends again. And one of the things I always told myself was never talk before Bob Sandusky, but I guess I've got to break that rule. Um, Fred Peitzman said a very telling thing, I think, that it is people that made Northrop what it is today. And for the next couple of minutes or so, I'd like to try to pay tribute to the people of Northrop. And I want to start where aircraft are born, which is in the advanced design teams. Teams led by brilliant designers like Irv Warland and the next speaker, Bob Sandusky. The design teams are responsible for originating a concept evolving it until the design and the requirements are in alignment. And then in due course come the implementers, the developers, the builders, the testers, and all the many disciplines that are necessary to bring an aircraft to fruition. Thousands of people, more people than you can name, thousands in Northrop, in its suppliers, 
and in its great customer communities. People working together, striving daily, solving problems, overcoming setbacks, and everybody stretching to their limit. And stretch they must, because aerospace is difficult. Just think how many companies, how many nations even, can design a modern high-performance aircraft and bring it to successful operation. The people of Northrop are indeed an elite. They are among the best of the best in the world. And they have to be because flight is unforgiving. It does not tolerate mistakes or carelessness. The hardware doesn't care how polished the PowerPoint charts are, nor does it hear the eloquence of your voice. The only thing that the hardware cares about is how well you did your job. And for this reason, I believe that aerospace attracts and breeds a special kind of person. Someone who is talented, honest, dependable, and undaunted by difficulty. And so, out of all this talent and all this struggle, great products arise, and with them, priceless moments for those who've worked on them. A rollout, a first delivery, a first flight, or if you really won the jackpot, a Collier Trophy award night. And on those occasions, there is a special feeling among people of shared pride who have done their utmost to bring a dream to reality. And the feeling is not momentary. It does not diminish with time, but it forever binds people who have earned mutual trust and respect doing something very difficult and very worthwhile. And this, to me, is what Northrop is all about. Thank you, Brian Hunt. Okay, next speaker. With over 30 years of experience in aircraft design, research, and instruction, he was named the first inventor of the Northrop's F-20 Tiger Shark and the YF-23. He was the chief engineer of the YF-23, also known as the Advanced Tactical Fighter. And he continues in the aerospace industry today as Sandusky, Sandusky Aeronautics. Please welcome Bob Sandusky. I'm here today to talk about the um, YF-17. And I'm limiting to that because there's so much history to cover. Cindy asked me to cover one small part of it, and that was my first introduction to Northrop. And so this will be a bit of a history lesson. In the 60s, the Air Force, in its wisdom, wanted to have another F-15. They wanted to have another follow-on to that. Well, they eventually got that with the F-22. But there was a mafia within the Air Force. And the mafia consisted, I see some smiles, you know where this is coming from. Well, it consisted of three guys. One was Pierre Spray, who was a lobbyist in Washington. And, oh, if you ever heard of these names, either clap, cheer, or boo, whichever, whichever you feel most about. Pierre Spray was a, a Washington lobbyist um, who had a vision for a lightweight fighter. Not some great huge airplane, but a yank and bank, turn and burn kind of airplane. He was joined by Colonel Rich Riccioni, also a fighter pilot. Thank you. And by John Boyd, 
who actually wrote the book on uh, air crime button maneuvering. So the three of those guys went around to the aerospace companies uh, quite intently behind the Air Force uh, to lobby for this position. Now Northrop was in the position of already uh, designing what they thought would be a foreign export fighter, the Cobra, which is what became the YF-17. Uh, at that time, believe it or not, there were six aerospace companies that said, we're going to join this. Uh, Boeing had the model 508, and the configurator was Bud Nelson. Okay. <laughs> and I worked for him uh, as the configuration designer, the guy that actually drew the airplane. And uh, that was our entry. Lockheed had a big wing F-104. They had re-engined the F-104 and put a big wing on it. General Dynamics had a single engine version with the Pratt & Whitney F-15 engine. Northrop had the Cobra design, which was really led by Lee Began, who had also designed the F-5. And Lee's long gone, so I'm not surprised that you don't remember him. Uh, Mac Air and Rockwell were also in the competition, but they didn't count. <laughs> um, shortly after that, the competition was, was held to, between these six companies for a 50-page technical proposal. That's it, 50 pages, to design your airplane. And the down select was made for Northrop with the YF-17 and General Dynamics with the F-16. Now, the 508 I worked on at Northrop, I felt the F-16 had stolen our design because they were very similar. But, so I decided I was not going to go to General Dynamics. I uh, wrote to Walt Fellers and said, uh, you need me. And they said, Walt Fellers, thank you. He's truly one of the designers that we left out today. He was, he was a remarkable man. Um, all right, so I wrote and said, uh, you need me, and he wrote back, no, we don't, but let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I came down, and I was uh, ambushed at the airport by Hagaz Durian. you smiling, clap. <laughs> and I said, I, would, I think I would like to work for Jerry Huben, <laughs> who was the head of the configuration department, which was my skill at the time. Uh, and Haig said, no, 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 you don't want to work for those guys. Uh, you want to work for the, in the performance area with, on real important stuff. And I said, yeah, but I think I, and he said, no, 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 no. So anyway, make a long story short, John Paterno <laughs> was the head of aerospace sciences and working for him was Haig Asdurian in aircraft performance and uh, engine integration and working for him was Warren Walski, who was truly my second mentor after Bud Nelson, who taught me the ins and outs of how to calculate yank and bank and turn and burn. Uh, so uh, Warren and I became the P cubed operation of the YF-17, and that was called the uh, Polish performance pair. <laughs> and we actually signed that on the uh, flight manual uh, that no one ever figured out what that meant until later. So then we entered into, uh, I guess I should say, I got there in, um, on my birthday in 1972, shortly after the contract was awarded. And as the program prototype development evolved, weight growth continued. And the minimum drag was woefully underestimated. Uh, the RFP required for the airplane to accelerate from 9 tenths Mach number to 1.6 in 60 seconds. Uh, the, the Northrop proposal said we could reach Mach 2 in afterburner and easily meet the requirement. When we got to flight test, the airplane couldn't accelerate to Mach 1.6 unless it was in a dive. So it was supposed to be in level flight. And that's, I think, the primary reason we lost that competition. But never fear, the Navy was interested, and they would be damned if they would buy an Air Force airplane. <laughs> so the Navy said, well, we're interested in the airplane, 
but we really want a Navy contractor to be prime. And the Navy had only two prime contractors, and that was Grumman and McDonnell Douglas. And so McDonnell Douglas teamed with us, with us being subservient to McDonnell Douglas as the prime. Uh, shortly after that, as much as I enjoyed the flight test program and following it all the way, really from the first line on the paper at Boeing to through a prototype flight test program and then on to production of the F-18, I decided I wanted to go back to advanced design. So I did. Our next speaker is a long-term Northrop Grumman employee who happens to be a TRW legacy, and she is the mayor of El Segundo. Please welcome Suzanne Fuentes. It's such an honor to be here. I am a 27-year employee of Northrop Grumman and a member of the Management Club, which if you don't belong, you should join. Um, I am afforded a lot of privileges as the mayor in that I get to spend a lot of my PTO to go out and meet with our Congress members and other electeds in California to talk about the importance of keeping the aerospace industry in, in Los Angeles and in the South Bay. And um, there's so many reasons I'm ecstatic to have Northrop Grumman in El Segundo. The one is, as an employee, I know it is a good place to work. I also know it is a good business to have, good corporate neighbor, good corporate citizenship. I'm, I'm very grateful. And the other thing, when I meet with these electeds, the point I always try to make, because we talk about jobs, how many jobs we provide, how much money we put into the economy, we keep the world a safer place. We sleep at night knowing that our children are safe and we are safe. And that's a point that I don't think is made to our electeds enough. So it is a privilege on the behalf of the city of El Segundo to give this proclamation. Whereas Jack Northrop, one of aviation's 20th century pioneers, founded Northrop Aircraft Incorporated in 1939 in the South Bay, and whereas the fledgling company contributed almost immediately to the Allied war effort with aircraft such as the N3PB patrol bomber and the P61 Black Widow night fighter. And whereas over the next four decades, Northrop aircraft developed novel aviation designs such as the flying wing, the F-89 Scorpion target drones, the T-38 trainer, the F-5 fighter, the first online intercontinental guided missile, and the B-2 stealth bomber, and whereas Northrop Corporation moved into a sprawling aircraft hangar in El Segundo in the late 1970s to begin production of a major fuselage section for the F-A-18 Hornet strike fighter that continued today and whereas the company began a series of strategic moves during the post Cold War period with the acquisition of among others the Grumman Corporation in 1994 Ryan Aeronautical in 1999 and the space and electronics segment of TRW incorporated in 2002 and whereas the companies that became the Northrop Grumman Corporation of today, a leading global security enterprise can point to a heritage of historic accomplishments from transporting Charles Lindbergh across the Atlantic to carrying astronauts to the surface of the moon and back. Now therefore, the city of El Segundo congratulates Northrop Grumman Corporation on its 75th anniversary and celebrates its many contributions to El Segundo's economic and community well-being. So on behalf of a grateful city, I thank and congratulate you and Mr. Vice, if I may. Thank you very much. Very happy to have you there. Thank you, speakers and attendees. Please go ahead and enjoy the 75th anniversary of the Northrop festivities today at this amazing venue. Lunch is served in the museum across the way. This completes the program. Thank you. I'm here with Bob Edinger. He's one of the test pilots for Northrop. What's it like to be a test pilot? Well, it's an interesting story. Uh, when I was in high school, I read these books about being a test pilot. And uh, I decided right then and there that I should be a test pilot. And uh, it's before I'd even flown in an airplane as a passenger. And uh, from there, uh, when I was, in, I decided that uh, in order to be a test pilot, you had to be an engineer. 
So I went to college at Berkeley uh, to earn a degree in mechanical engineering. And in those days, they had mandatory ROTC training for the first two years in uh, college for all male students. So I'm standing in the army line just trying to get over this ROTC commitment. <laughs> and I got to the head of the line and the, the sergeant there looked at my record and said, well, you're not colorblind and you don't wear glasses. Why do you want to be in the army? And I kind of didn't have an answer. So he looked over to his Air Force guy and said, kid, you're in the Air, Air Force ROTC. And the whole purpose of the two years of college ROTC was to convince you to go for two more years okay. and graduate with a commission in the service and serve in that service. And it worked. They convinced me that I wanted to be a pilot and I had already had that in mind so it all fit together and uh, graduated, uh, went to pilot training, uh, flew fighters, uh, flew in uh, Vietnam and then was uh, selected to attend the Air Force's test pilot school at the time which was called ARPA the advanced, um, let's see, I'm going to get it right now. It was called uh, ARPS, the Air, F Air Force Research Pilot School. And we all thought we were going to be astronauts. We had to take the physical that uh, the astronauts took. And um, it was kind of you bet your wings. Uh, every once in a while, about every other class of about 20 guys, when they did this physical in depth, it was uh, 10 10 days of doctors looking in every orifice and every possible thing you could imagine. Uh, they found something irrevocable on, uh, on about one every 40 guys, and they got grounded at that time. But anyway, that led to me being a test pilot, and uh, then uh, after f flying uh, fighters at Wright-Patterson doing systems test work, mm -hmm. I got reassigned to Edwards, and then an opening came up in the lightweight fighter Joint Test Force, where I had an opportunity to fly both the YF-16 and the YF-17, this airplane that we're standing in front of. And uh, as you can imagine, that was a rare opportunity. You know, uh, advanced technology airplanes, the highest level of technology and stuff. And I just come back from flying uh, uh, over North Vietnam in F-4s, kind of a antiquated, antiquated airplane, and. Uh, um, so it was really a great opportunity. And then when the uh, F-16 was chosen to be the Air Force's airplane, I stayed at Edwards for another five years, making a total of seven years, uh, working nothing but on the YF-16 or the YF-17, or the y F-16. How many planes did, were you a test pilot for, Bob? Well, I, I had the opportunity to fly maybe a hundred different types of airplanes. Wow. If you count, you know, A's and B's and C's and D's and stuff, and uh, gliders and big airplanes and little airplanes and all that stuff. But uh, testing uh, really it was involved in the F-4. I was a test pilot there. I uh, flew the F-100 flying test missions with that. I flew both the YF-16 and the YF-17, and then the F-16. And then as, uh, as I got older, uh, I actually ended up getting hired by Ryan Aeronautical and uh, led the test pro testing of the Global Hawk. Global Hawk's a large unmanned airplane, and you can imagine for a test pilot it's a little embarrassing to be the chief test pilot on an unmanned airplane. Well, thank you for your service, Bob. Okay, thank you. I'm here with Manny Duarte, and how were you involved with the F-14? Well, I was a plane captain and troubleshooter on the F-14 and VF-1. I was also a, a student in the uh, VF-124, the replenishment squadron for uh, the F-14s. And my last two cruises was, uh, was with uh, VF-11. Do you have a memorable time flying the F-14? The, the F-14 is a great, awesome airplane. Uh, it, it, it flew from, uh, basically flew from my whole career in the Navy, so it was uh, definitely a good airplane uh, to be around when I was out there with it. So you were in the Navy. Can you talk a little bit about being in the Navy? Yeah, I was in the Navy uh, for 21 years, almost 22 years. Mm -hmm. It was uh, uh, it, it, it took me around the world. As a, as a small child, I used to like reading the National Geographic. 
and the Navy took me there and made uh, it actually happen for me in, uh, in real life. And working on airplanes like the F-14 and also the Northrop F-5 throughout my career and the F-18, it, it actually covered all of the Northrop platforms. Well, the, uh, again, the F-14 was a great uh, aircraft. It, uh, it, it kept the Russians at bay. It actually, I think it helped in the Cold War and making the, air, making the Russians uh, go bankrupt trying to keep this airplane off their back. The airplane had uh, significant kills uh, throughout its career. It was, uh, and everybody that flew or, or worked on this airplane will stand right alongside it. If they came back, we'd be right alongside of her again. She's a good, good airplane, but she's gone and we're all good with that. We're working on the F-18s now. Thank you for your service, Manny. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your time. I'm here with Brian Hunt. He was involved with the YF-23 program with Northrop. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, the YF-23 program was a prototype program, so we were in competition with Lockheed, who had a uh, also had uh, a prototype entry called the YF-22. Um, both companies were to build, each company was to build two aircraft, which we did, um, <clears throat> and a decision about going to production would then come out of uh, the flight test program and also various other um, assessment criteria. My role on it <clears throat> for Northrop was that I was the manager of what was called technology. How does it feel to see one of these preserved at the Western Museum of Flight? 14, right behind us here, YF-23. Well, I'd rather see it flying. Uh, that was the intent, that's what I wish had happened. Um, but it's still good to see it here. It's anybody who takes a look at it, anybody who comes down to the museum and takes a look at this airplane will soon get the impression that it's a very special aircraft um, and it's certainly my personal belief that the fact that we didn't win the contract had nothing to do with the qualities of the airplane. Thank you for joining Peninsula Seniors out and about here at the Western Museum of Flight and Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.